Good morning. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, and again, that brings it all together for us and, and why we're here and why we do what we do. Uh, so I'm going to focus on intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, uh, resection, and regional therapies. And again, I would like to thank the organizers, the uh, foundation, Stacey, and everyone for the, uh, the privilege of uh, being here with you today. Um, so my outline will be, I'll kind of review the evolution of staging for this disease. Uh, then we'll look at resection, particularly the prognostic factors for recurrence and survival. And then kind of look at really how we define resectability, not only from a technical standpoint, but really I'm going to highlight the biological uh, factors that we look at as surgical oncologists when deciding when and if surgery plays a role in the treatment for patients. Uh, we'll cover some of the basics of regional therapy. You'll hear a little bit more about uh, SBRT in detail. And then I'll try to put it together in terms of clinical pathways, at least how I personally um, manage things in my clinic. As you saw yesterday, there is an incidence of rising intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, as you can see from the light gray bars. Um, and if this is a, um, there's something called the National Surgical Quality Initiative Improvement Program, or NISQIP, that looks at how we do in a perioperative setting for patients who undergo resection. And these are for cholangiocarcinoma. And if you look at the morbidity and mortality of this group that just underwent hepatectomy, which likely represents intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma, you can see that we're below the dashed line of uh, expected versus observed, which is good for morbidity, but our mortality is still high. So it really uh, points to the fact that we really need to be careful about patient selection, really operate on the right patients that we think we're going to help, not only in a long-term setting, but also in the short-term setting after operation. So let's look at the evolution of staging. So I'll take you back to the sixth edition, where uh, if you look at the T1, T2, T3, and T4, you can see that they looked at solitary versus multiple tumors. So number of tumors was a factor. The size was a factor. You can see that five centimeter cutoff in there. And then also uh, lymph nodes. And you can see that, um, sorry. You, you can see that N1 disease down the bottom was stage 3C. And then as each increasing T stage, you can see it goes from stage one, stage two, and stage three. Now, <clears throat> after the stage, uh, after the sixth edition came out, there was a study that came out looking at the SEER database, uh, looking at 600 patients from 88 to 2004 who underwent resection of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Now, based on the uh, talk we, we heard yesterday, you can see that inclusion criteria of site codes, which supposedly excluded clad skins, may be problematic, as we know that that last code came out in 2003. Nevertheless, this was viewed as a large 600 patient series of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And when the, when the authors looked at factors that were prognostic for survival and outcomes of patients, you can see from the top that they actually saw that tumor size, that five centimeter cutoff that was part of the sixth edition, was no longer prognostic for survival, as you can see from the NS or not significant. But multiple tumors versus single and vascular evasion persisted as uh, important prognostic factors. So they proposed a new T-stage classification that actually removed size from the uh, classification of the T-stage. They kept solitary versus multiple. As you can see, the multiple was uh, designated T2B. And, um, and then uh, lymph nodes were kept um, as well as just N0 and N1. And using this proposed classification, when they looked at the experience of those 600 patients in that SEER database, they found that with this simplified staging system, it actually segregated the uh, patient and the curves uh, based on T-stage better than the sixth edition. So that really led to the evolution of the sixth going into the seventh edition. And now you can see that on the T-staging, you can see size was eliminated. Uh, multiple tumors was designated T2. Uh, and you'll see that multiple tumors, again, based on T2, was still only designated stage 2. Uh, and lymph node disease, uh, when it was involved, was actually stage 4 disease for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, which interestingly is different for perihilar and for distant uh, cholangiocarcinoma. So the, the impact of lymph nodes is actually staged differently for each of those three sites of disease. So <clears throat> leave the staging behind for a second. Now let's look at the experience of large resection series and, and look at prognostic factors for survival and recurrence. So this was a, a series that came out of Memorial Sloan Kettering of 238 patients who presented with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And right away you can see that a little over half were unresectable at presentation. So we really need lots of improvement in earlier stage of uh, diagnosis, which is, which is difficult, specifically for intrahepatic cholangio. Now, of the patients who were explored, 
Another third of them were found to be unresectable at operation, either due to metastases or peritoneal disease or local advancement. Whatever the reason, in the end, of all patients who presented, a little less than a third actually underwent a curative intent resection. And what were the factors that, of those patients who underwent resection, what were the factors that were associated with survival? You can see, although size was taken out of the uh, staging system in the seventh edition, you can see again on that left side, the uh, tumors greater than five centimeters had reduced survival compared to those in less than five centimeters. And patients who had multiple tumors actually had decreased survival compared to those who presented with solitary. So you'll see this theme of size and number of tumors. Now, it's important to note that the pathologic factors of cholangiocarcinoma are not occurring in isolation. So you can see here the, the factors of multiple tumors, lymph node involvement, the grade and vascular invasion, they all kind of increase and correlate with as the increasing size goes up, as you can see the uh, kind of slope of those bar graphs go upward. So all of these, all of these pathologic factors are working in concert. And if we look at recurrence, if you look at that far left uh, uh, bar graph there, 60% of patients who undergo resection will have recurrence. Now, if we start breaking out the patients who have good prognostic factors with single tumors, no lymph node metastases, we can drop that number to 40%. But the patients with high-risk disease, i.e. vascular invasion, multiple tumors, or lymph node metastases, recurrence is almost uniform at 90%. And if you look at that pie graph, the majority of recurrences are occurring in the liver. Now, if, again, the importance of uh, recurrence, is, uh, of size for recurrence as well, you can see that patients who have tumors with greater than five centimeters shown in blue have earlier recurrence than those in less than five centimeters. Keep in mind, at this time, size is still not part of the staging system. Now, people have put together scoring systems. We often take these prognostic factors and try to put them together and create a scoring system. And if we look at three such, such as major vascular invasion, size greater than five centimeters, and lymph node involvement, and you give a score of zero, one, two, or three based on the number of those factors you have, you can see that the green and orange lines of having either two or three, of scoring a two or three, you have decreased survival and earlier recurrence. And it's important to note that the most common site of recurrence actually is the liver, as I showed you on that pie graph, but about two-thirds of patients, when they recur, will be actually in the liver itself. So that brings to the next question. If we see these two types of morphologic patterns, on the left you see two, three small tumors kind of scattered in both lobes. Very often we see what you see on the right, a large dominant tumor with what we call satellite nodules or, uh, you know, basically moons around the um, dominant lesion. So is this really considered multiple tumors, or T2, which I showed you as stage two? Or, given the fact that I told you the majority of recurrences happen in the liver, should we view this as stage four disease? It's very difficult. Um, you know, it's a cuff and done and managed on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. But I will tell you, the multiple tumors, although still only a stage two based on that uh, AGC seventh stage, I think biologically, at least how I view them, I view them a little bit more in the advanced and kind of view things as stage four and, and model the uh, treatment plan based on that. So what about, let's talk about lymph nodes for a second. This was a, a multinational study done uh, with 11 different institutions looking at over a pretty long period of time, almost 40 years, of 450 patients who underwent resection of intrahepatic cholangio. Interestingly, only half of the patients underwent a lymph node dissection. So doing a portal lymph node dissection, taking around the lymph nodes that are basically around the main blood vessels and the bile ducts that feed the liver, is not uniform practice. Uh, hopefully we're moving toward that. But of the patients who underwent lymph node dissection, a third were positive, and when positive, it was associated with reduced survival. And the importance of lymph node involvement, as I told you in, in the uh, seventh edition, was designated stage four disease, is seen here. As you can see, in patients who are considered N0 or lymph node negative on the left, you can see the importance of vascular invasion in the dashed line, where there's reduced survival compared to those who do not have vascular invasion. However, once the lymph nodes are involved, the importance of vascular invasion disappears. And you'll see that similar trend with a uh, number of tumors, as again, in patients who have no lymph nodes involved, there's an influence of the number of tumors. However, once the lymph nodes involved, Really, the number of tumors uh, doesn't seem to be much of a prognostic factor. So it's important that when we're operating, if not for a therapeutic reason, if not, uh, more importantly, maybe for a staging and kind of prognosticating and guiding further therapy, lymph node dissection should be routinely performed at the time of resection for intrahepatic cholangio, as it is for perihyalur and distal cholangiocarcinoma. 
So as is done for many solid organ malignancies, uh, people have made uh, these nomograms, and this such nomogram includes tumor uh, factors such as vascular invasion, lymph node metastases, tumor markers that are involved in the serum. And again, you can see that in this nomogram, size was included. And furthermore, this nomogram was actually done by the same author who proposed uh, the new staging system that eliminated size, and interestingly in their nomogram, size was in that as well. So now comes the eighth edition, which just came out last year, and now you'll see that size is back. You'll see that five centimeters up in the left corner, although still only in the T1 category, multiple tumors has persisted and lymph nodes has persisted, but you'll see that um, the size is only, again, stage one designation, 1A versus 1B by the five centimeter cutoff, even though I showed you the prognostic implication of tumors greater than five centimeters. You can see that multiple tumors is still only stage two, and the importance of lymph node, uh, lymph node positivity has actually been downstage to stage 3B from stage four, despite some of the data that I just showed you. So <clears throat> looking now at, uh, we've done, some studies are coming out now looking at the prognostic ability of the eighth edition versus the seventh edition, and this is a, a quote from, I could say the HGCC eighth edition staging system was largely comparable to the seventh edition and did not provide a marked improvement in overall prognostic discrimination. So regardless of staging, I think we have a long way to go with staging still. We haven't quite figured it out, but I think hopefully I've outlined some of these. When we approach patients and determine resectability, it's not just technical um, factors such as the inflow, outflow, the biliary, and the remnant size. Those are, honestly, those are the easy parts. It's the biological part that's really more important. What are the factors that are contributing to recurrence and survival? And as I showed you, size, number of tumors, vascular invasion, lymph node status, those are four main things that we often look at when we're evaluating patients patients in our clinic. So we really have to take our attitude from a can-do, and can I cut that out, to a should I take that out, or should surgery be the initial part of uh, the treatment plan in the uh, entire treatment paradigm. So let's say we decide that surgery should not be the first uh, therapy. Uh, what are the other options outside of systemic chemotherapy, which you heard a lot about yesterday and you'll hear a little more about today, but I'll focus some on some of the regional therapies. So what about transarterial chemoembolization, or TACE? Now, when you see these survivals, you see these are for patients with unresectable cholangial carcinoma who are selected for undergo TACE, which is, again, transarterial chemoembolization, and you'll see a median overall survival of 23 months. Now, you look at that and you, you say, wow, that's, that's almost twice as much as the 11.7 months we saw in the ABCO2 trial with GEMSYS. It's important to note that these are very selected patients, and that 23 months is based on these 17 patients treated at Hopkins. These are not patients that are just, every patient's undergoing this, these are all very, very selected. They're very heterogeneous. And you have to look at, again, are these, are these types of experiences reproducible? This is an experience uh, from our colleagues in Korea. You can see that with taste compared to supportive management for unresectable, their uh, median survival was 13 months, and for patients who had disease outside the liver was reduced to 11 months. Also, when you do taste, it's transarterial chemoembolization. There's differing drugs you can use along with the beads. And uh, this group from Pittsburgh looked at using the beads with uh, gem cis based on the ABCO2 experience versus gem alone and found that there was a doubling of survival when they uh, used taste with gem cis. But again, you can see these numbers are, are still very modest. And looking at a, a paper that kind of compiled all these experiences, you can see that the number of patients that are included in these studies, anywhere from 8 to 40 patients, and the survival is running anywhere from 9 to 23 or 30 months. It's very, very heterogeneous and very, very dependent on patient selection. So you'll see this theme kind of running as we look at now another regional therapy, yttrium-90 or radioembolization. Um, you look at, this is the, a group from uh, Northwestern where Riyadh Salam really leads the efforts nationally with uh, Y90, and you can see how performance status, what we call ECOG performance status, uh, presence of extrahepatic disease, tumor morphology, all of these factors contribute to how patients do after receiving Y90. Again, emphasizing the importance of patient selection as we try these other regional therapy um, options. And this just graphically shows you that patients with, um, the, the median survival was 9.3 months, but patients who had a peripheral morphology over infiltrative, good performance status, and no extrahepatic disease, shown in blue, and all of those curves seem to do better. 
Our experience at Emory when we used Y90, these are patients who were pre-treated with chemo, so these are patients who are receiving Y90 as a second-line treatment, if you will. You can see, again, very well-selected patients, but 62% 18-month survival from diagnosis. More important, half of them alive one year after receiving Y90. Again, this would be in the second-line setting, which is actually fairly good results uh, compared to other systemic options in the second-line setting. So does taste better, or is, is bland, um, bland embolization better versus Y90? This was a compilation of five institutions looking at this. It really seems to be similar. Really, whatever's your institution expertise or your interventional radiology colleagues expertise, that's really what you should use. So hepatic arterial infusion therapy is another option for liver-directed therapy. It's a little bit more invasive, requires an operation to place the pump. This is the experience at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which has really led the world in, ter in terms of using uh, this type of therapy for cancers, the largest experience being with colorectal liver metastases. But these were used in patients with unresectable primary liver cancers, of which 26 of these patients had intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Again, very well chosen, no extrahepatic disease, had good performance status, and they had a median survival of almost 30 months. Again, keep these uh, numbers of systemic chemotherapy of uh, 12 months, and, and the, the needle is moving, but um, it's all very provocative data. Now, the problem with the pump is that the data has never been reproducible outside of that square block in Manhattan in the Upper East Side. And if you look at the experience from Japan, again, using the pump, you can see those numbers are nowhere near the 30 months. But something, again, to keep in mind. Now, SBRT, or stereotactic radio body radiation therapy, you'll hear more about later from uh, one of the national leaders of this, but I'll just give you a hint on this. Again, very new experience. We're gaining experience with this. Um, a, a collection of studies here with anywhere from 3 to 20, 30 patients, and you can see the median survival ranging anywhere from 11 to 30 months. Again, still very, very dependent on patient selection, but our radiation colleagues are doing this right. They have put together a, um, an international trial, really, that's looking at this in a random fashion. If we can get this trial to accrue, hopefully we'll have answers. We're struggling with getting this to accrue. Again, you'll hear more about that later. So how do we put this all together in terms of clinical decision making? I've borrowed from the pancreas cancer paradigm where we look at patients with uh, resectable, borderline resectable, and locally advanced non-resectable. So if patients present with resectable, again, both technically and biologically, small tumor, solitary, no lymph, no lymph node enlargement, I think doing upfront resection for those patients followed by adjuvant therapy, which you'll hear more about in the next talk, I think is a very reasonable uh, paradigm. For patients with unresectable disease, whether it's technical or biologically unresectable, again, systemic chemotherapy, chemotherapy combined with liver-directed therapy, there's many trials being uh, proposed on that notion, or based on patient individual preferences or performance status, maybe liver-directed therapy, specifically if it's liver-only disease and it's unresectable. The, the focus, however, in most of the patients that we'll see um, in, in terms of at the surgical clinic will be what we call in this borderline resectable or high-risk group. And again, these are the technically either high-risk or, more importantly, biologically high-risk. Size greater than five centimeters, multiple nodules, major vascular invasion, or enlarged lymph nodes where we're concerned that the lymph nodes are involved. In those patients, I think so, although surgery has a role, I do not think it should be the first role in, uh, or the first treatment in the treatment paradigm. And these patients should either get some sort of systemic chemotherapy, chemotherapy with liver-directed therapy, or a liver-directed therapy, again, depending on the situation, for either three, four, six months, depending on the uh, protocol that's designed. And then if patients either are stable or have good response, then those patients are the ones we take to surgery. Again, giving them the test of time and hoping to allow the best outcome and the best long-term outcomes for patients who undergo the risk of uh, hepatic resection for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So that's really where we should go for borderline. So along that note, again, on the strength and the foundation of this organization and the, um, the International Cholangiocarcinoma Research Network, Network. Uh, my colleagues, Dr. Roca and I, and, and the group, along with, again, the ICRN, we're really trying to uh, put this uh, single-arm feasibility study of using GEMSYS and NABPACLITAXOL as neoadjuvant therapy for what we were calling high-risk 
intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And it's exactly what I just defined for you. The bigger tumors, the multiple tumors, major vascular invasion, or suspected lymph node involvement. The choice of this regimen is based off the experience that MD Anderson and Mayo have in the uh, metastatic setting. We've seen very good responses. We're working with our uh, cell gene colleagues to get this, and hopefully we'll have this type of trial open in the next three, four months uh, as we continue to push this forward. Again, th this, this kind of stuff happens with the strength and foundation of a, a group such as yourselves that's very committed to this and, uh, and good colleagues. So with that, um, I'll end, and uh, thank you very much. It's an honor and privilege to speak to you today.